The way we take care of ourselves is ever evolving. And what we know for sure is that our mind and spirit are linked to our physical body and that our wellness seems to extend into our communities and the planet we all share. It is very, very clear that wellness is interconnected. We love spending time with you to explore and practice the breakthroughs, the insights, and the passions of incredible people helping us all see the world in a whole new light. This is HealthGig. Dora and I are thrilled to have David Gherkin on HealthGig today. David is a longtime friend of Doro's and her husband, Bobby, and has a really incredible life story. And we can't wait for him to share that with all of you today. And where he is right now is someplace that Dora and I talk a lot about, and that is exploring what mindfulness means to each one of us and how we can incorporate mindfulness in our life. David Gherkin, welcome to Health Gig. Uh, Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Full disclosure, you and I are friends from a long time ago. Long time ago. I'm so glad to see you. And Tricia was very excited to meet you. Really excited. All right. Yeah. We want to start by just having you tell us a little bit about you and where you grew up and your family. I know you have a lot of siblings and how you sort of landed where you are. So do you have about three hours for that? (laughs) I know. No, I'm good at this. I'll get it done as quickly, but as fulsomely as possible. So I grew up in Newport Beach, where I am right now. I left here 36 years ago and then moved back. I went away to college. Then then I went to uh, D.C., Doro, that's when we met. I actually met you. I think I met you before Bobby met you. (laughs) Probably. that's That's how far back we go. And then I worked on Capitol Hill. I did the lobbying thing, but I just knew that that was not my sole satisfying thing. I'd started writing screenplays and stuff like that with a friend of mine who'd been in the business and was in it in a big way in LA. So long story short, I moved out to LA in 2001. I sort of scrambled hard and I worked. I got a job on the West Wing writing, which was just a real treat. Love that. And I did that for several years, but it, you know, it is a, you, whatever you've heard, it's a tough business. There's nine squillion people chasing 10 jobs. But wait, you won an Emmy. Yes, ma'am. Please talk about that. That's a big deal. Oh, I'm going to show you something. I know the audience can't see this, but this is my uh, picture on the stage. Look for the bald guy. I'm sort of in the middle. I see you. Yeah, Yeah. Aaron. And then it's way off to the, I believe, over here is Rudy Giuliani, who uh, was the uh, presenter that year. And then I don't know what happened to him, but but that's another story for another podcast. And it all, you know, it all went well, but, but, you know, it's just hard. And I got married and I had kids and it was just, you know, really difficult uh, for a while because it's, you know, it's just hard to find work. And as a writer out there, it came and went. And then I was so uptight, I got into meditation, which really was helping. And my sister was really into this stuff. And she kind of got me into it. My older sister, well, they're all older. I'm the youngest of five. Dora, you and I are the cabooses in our families. (laughs) And I don't know about you, but I loved it. Still do. So I just started doing more and more of that. And finally, it kind of hit me like, this is what I really love to do. And I started exploring more of it. And learning about the Mickey Singers and the Eckhart Tolle's and the, all these luminaries, the Ram Dass and, you know, all of it. And I just loved it. We ended up saying, Hey, you know, the only reason we're in LA is because of the business. If I'm going to get out of the business, let's move. So we moved to Newport beach where I have two sisters and a brother still here, aunts, uncles, and cousins and everything. And so that's what we did back in 2018. And I've been doing this stuff. I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Ryan Holiday. Does that ring a bell? He's a best-selling author. He had this business on the side where helping people, consulting on writing and stuff, or books and stuff. And he's the one who told me about Medium. I'd never heard of Medium.com before. And so he said, just start writing on that. I had written a book, and his point was, don't go out with the book now. Build an audience and then go out with the book. So that's why I started on Medium, and that's what I've been doing. And in between that time, I've taught meditation classes online and just all kinds of stuff like that. And that's pretty much what I'm up to. So on Medium, and again, we actually learned about that 
through knowing you now, you know, right. cause, and so what is that? People can go on and read your stuff. And as I read it, you're paid. Yes. It's, it's, it's based on like, yeah, yeah it's a subscription. It is. Now the ones that you get, Doro, you can have as this friends thing. And that's the thing that I'm sending out in various newsletters and things nobody has to pay for. It's great. I mean, um, I've had pretty good success on it over the years. I don't do anything other than focus on writing. For better or worse, I sort of go back to, I don't know if you guys know of the Bhagavad Gita, the great sort of Hindu text from 2,000 years ago. But one of its main tenets is don't be attached to the fruits of your action. Mm. You know, just do your stuff and let it go. And that's what I've been doing. And it's been, I've got 186,000 people following me now. I think there's probably something like 500,000 people around the world who write on Medium. And that's probably one of the top 10 or 20, you know, followers and all those many hundreds of thousands. So, but that's all I do. I don't focus. I don't get, I, I probably should, but it's like, oh, what's your Twitter handle? And what's your Instagram? And why are you pushing out it on uh, Facebook? I just like, I write my stuff and I just sort of send just it out it to go. the universe and see what happens. So also what's so fun about reading your stuff is you sort of take us with you on your research in a way. So again, Mickey Singer, you went and you visited with him. Yeah. Tell us how that goes for you. Are you researching or are you staying in the moment as you go to visit different people? I love what you said about Eckhart Tolle. This is why you spend $200 a year. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in subscription. Yeah. Tell us how it goes for you. I would not call any of this like research in the so traditional you're sense. Yeah. I'm just learning. I wouldn't say that it's like I think about researching my senior thesis at Princeton, you know, where I'm <laughs> killing myself. This is not killing myself. I'm just learning. And on my desk right now, I have the book by Ramana Maharshi, Be As You Are. I've got the Bhagavad Gita. I've got a couple of Mickey's books. I got Ram Dass's book be here now, whatever. I mean, I just love it. I read it. I absorb it. And I write about it. I mean, that's kind of how I view myself in a sense is I almost view myself as a translator in a sense of a lot of these great ideas and sort of universal concepts that have been around for thousands of years, but put in a language that is accessible to you, yes. to my family, to my friends, and to people out yonder. I try to make it fun. I try yeah. not to get all serious about it where everyone's like, oh my God, he's got a ponytail and he's talking about his <laughs> latest vegan dish that he's serving up. I don't do that because <laughs> it's not me for one. Dora, you know me. I'm insane. Yeah, you um, are. We had so much fun. That's who I am. But I'm also serious about this stuff. And I think it's a good combination because a lot more people will you make it relatable. Of, yeah, relatable and fun. It's and not something high up on a mountaintop where people can't access. You just make it relatable and there's no wrong way to do it. And exactly. You sort of teach that it's not that hard. It's an interesting thing because it's so simple that especially here in America, where people are taught, as you well know, especially in your area out there in D.C., everyone's charging hard. It's about power and who knows who and, oh, well, who's in and who's out, you know, work, work, work. For those types of people, meditation is the hardest because they keep thinking there's got to be some secret something going on. What am I not doing? And it's so simple that they don't get it. It's, it just freaks people out to just stop. That's really what it is. It's just stopping it's doing your best to just stop and be rather than do. You know, everyone is so into doing in our country. There's a great line in the, my favorite book of wisdom is the Tao Te Ching. If you guys haven't read it, you have to, because guess what? It'll take you like two hours. It's pretty short and it's really easy to read too. It's not like crazy language. There's a great thing in there where it says, practice not doing and everything will fall into place. You know, this is written like 2,500 years ago, but he's so on. If you just sort of stop your mind and stop from going crazy and thinking, 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 and that's where real genius comes from, is in that stillness. 
I hear you on that, but what oftentimes happens is I sit and my mind's still going. That voice is still talking to me. It's still there. And in fact, sometimes it really likes it because it's quiet and now it can really roll. <laughs> you know what? Both Mickey Singer and Eckhart Tolle say the same thing about what you just said. Because people come to them all the time and say exactly what you just said. I tried it, but my mind was just going crazy. And Mickey will say, well, guess what? How do you know that your mind was racing? Yeah, you were there noticing it. There is you, the real consciousness, conscious you, and the thoughts. And that in itself is a huge value because most of the time people are just lost in it. There is no you. There's just the thoughts. There's just that mishmash and there's no one noticing it. That's all meditation really is, is just noticing what's going on in the present moment. It might be the sounds of uh, the cars going by. That's happening in the moment. It might be your thoughts racing around. That's happening. You know, it's funny looking at your life and your accomplishments and things. It looks like things were going pretty well, though. You said as a writer, it kind of stopped. But I mean, you were a tennis player. You went to Princeton. You got your master's. You were pretty successful when you were in D.C. Were you just not happy? Is that what happened? What drew you there? Did you have to wait for a crisis or did it just find you? Well, there, it's sort of a two-step thing. First, there's D.C. to L.A. And then there was L.A. writing to meditation and all that stuff. In yeah. the first stage, because this is Hollywood, I call this my third act. Any movie has three acts. So the first act was DC. And what happened there was I was doing well and lobbying and making a lot of money and all that. But it just is such a ridiculous business. It really is. It's just, I mean, it really is about who you know and your friends. And you've got friends that are senators. And I just, I was like, I did that for eight years or something like that. And I was just like, this is just not something I can do for my whole life. So I just knew I had to move on. And I that was to... hard? Or is that just sort of like you just knew it just wasn't what you wanted? Well, it, and it didn't happen overnight. I started writing in about 97, I think. And I didn't move until 2000. It was sort of like, am I going to be a dilettante and sort of be the DC guy who writes screenplays, but probably nothing happens? Or you got to get your butt out there and really go for it and dive in. So that's what I finally decided to do is just dive in. It wasn't as tough as it thinks. I had a decent amount of money saved up. That's one big help. A lot of people just go there with nothing and they're waiting tables. So I didn't have to do that. And second, I had friends. I mean, my best friend then and now, and another guy, my roommate in college, all three of us are real close. They were already in the business. It's not like I went out there with nothing. I already had a bit of a leg up. And then it just sort of got going. Who are the people that you coach for mindfulness? Or are you out on the speaking circuit? Or what are you doing? Well, it's honestly, mainly right now, I am just writing the article. Just the writing. Mainly, that's what I'm doing. You see, I wrote this book. It was just about meditation. I want to do a book, but it's more than just meditation. It's going to be more into sort of mindfulness and just sort of a bigger picture, almost like a health, but you know, I know this is health gig. It really is about an overall health slash happiness plan I want to do. And I just keep sort of circling and it's weird. I, I don't have a problem. I, I actually would love to write. I love writing books and stuff like that. I love it. It's sort of like life was directing you, right? Is that what's happening? You're sort of like, okay, I'm here. Life, tell me where I'm going. And it feels like you say yes to things now. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. This gets to a massive central theme issue matter for me. Like, Doro, your father was successful, okay? As was your brother. President doesn't get much bigger than that. But my dad was also I don't know if you know this. He was the CEO of Pacific Life, you know, the one with the whales and yeah. that oh, whole thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, he created PIMCO. I don't know if you've heard of PIMCO. It's one of the largest yes. Yes. bond funds in the world, you know, that he created that when he was at Pacific wow. Life as a subsidiary. So massively successful guy. And all my brothers and sisters are at Harvard and Stanford and all this stuff. So I had a ton of pressure 
And I believe we all have a core issue. You know, most of us have several issues, but there's usually one that is the one that we struggle with throughout our lives. And my was always that, like trying to be big, trying to be, you know, extraordinary and that kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of therapy over the years, you know. But it gets to your point, uh, we talking about, so are you listening to life and saw that? Well, that's been my issue is it's been mostly about ego. Yeah. About, yes. okay, I have to do stuff to be big. So I got to be a big writer. Family. Yeah, press everybody, everybody. Talk about pressure. In my class in college, we have, if not the richest guy in the world, top two or three in Jeff Bezos. And we have a Nobel Peace Prize winner. <laughs> so it's like, what am I doing? I stink. <laughs> but anyway, it's just that kind of pressure. And so this has been one of the great things. Like when I talked to you 10, 20 minutes ago about how I am not being attached to the fruits of my action, that's what I'm trying to do. That's a huge thing for me, you know, in my own personal journey, because that was never, I was always, oh, I have to do this so I can get that. Yeah. And if I do this, I mean, just being a little schemer, you know, scheming this thing and that thing. And that's what DC is all about. It's a lot of what LA is about is who's going to get up and hey, you got to go to this party because that person's going to be there. And well, it's just so freeing and just I feel so good with this thing about you can call it God, you can call it the universe nature, whatever you want to call it, I am sort of giving myself up to that. And by the way, it's a, <laughs> this sounds so crass, but it's a great strategy for life. And it's really the best strategy for anybody. If you really want to go up there, I, that is just quieting down and letting whatever you want to call it. Again, I try not to get too religious per se, in my right. stuff, because I don't want to turn people off. And I always give several options. You know, it's like, God, who cares? It could be Allah. It could be whatever. I don't care. It's some higher power who wants to work through you, me, everybody. That's what is going on out there. That's what I believe. And the way that we can allow that power to work through us is to quiet our frigging heads down. Yeah. You know, and that's what this is about. And when we do that, when we do all this work that I'm working on with the meditation and mindfulness, and frankly, I always throw in prayer, you know, as long as you're not sitting there saying, I, I want to pray for a new Mercedes. Prayer is the same kind of thing. It's just getting quiet and letting this thing work through us. When we do that, we do our best writing. We do our best parenting. We do our best being of a friend to people. So if you're a car salesman, I don't care. You're going to do your best work. The quieter you are and the more this thing is working through you. Here's how I sort of uh, a little metaphor I came up with, which is we are in this car and there's this car radio. There's this radio station. Let's call it W. G-O-D, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> beaming out signals. And this it's stuff that is trying to get into our car radio, but there's static. And it can't get through because of the static is the mind. It's all this stuff. And when we start to quiet it down, this stuff can sort of get through that radio and into us. And it's mysterious and it's subtle. And it's not like you can just say, oh, you're a crown. You know, you just have to sort of go with it. I really believe that. And it's really working. I've never been happier you know, so uh, and I've had a great life, unbelievably fortunate. I've mentioned my family and it's so much pressure. They're great people. To this day, there's six kids. I have a brother who's 70. I mean, we are all very close. We get together. I'm lucky as heck. I don't want to complain about my family. No, I no, know. But I think what you're saying is kind of really interesting because like you said, you've had this really remarkable life in many ways, but it's how you were experiencing it. What could have happened is the same scenario, but you would be experiencing it differently if your mind wasn't struggling. So we don't need to struggle, as I think what you're telling us. We don't really need to struggle. We need to be and things happen. Is that right? There's a lot of different ways. This is my, I've written about this from so many different angles. I think the simplest way to put it is just quieting down inside, just quieting down. 
And it's not easy because we've spent our whole life doing this inside. Everyone's doing it and it's just, it's hard. But I'm telling you, you can make progress, little bits. It's like Michelangelo sculpting the David. You know, he had a massive block of marble and it took two or three years of just the little chip, little chip, little chip. And every day he's just making progress. And that's what it's like. And in the end, what do you have? You have this beautiful, beautiful, perfect thing inside, which is accessible to any of us if we just sort of stay with it. And who knows if we'll get to that absolute perfection. There's not many people, I would say Eckhart maybe comes a little close as far (laughs) as just being what I would define perfection as. He even says it, Eckhart says, the only real accomplishment I have in my life is that I cannot think if I don't want to. That's pretty much it. But that's huge. That is huge. (laughs) We have such a negative bias in our heads. Why do we get stuck on the negative? Oh, the negativity bias. Well, it's ego. It's ego. I mean, when I say ego, I want to make sure your audience knows. In our society, we generally think of that as being, oh, I'm great and I'm better than you are, and he's got a big ego. That's a part of it, but it's not nearly all of it. Ego comprises, a lot of it has to do with our fears, that we grow up with a lot of fear, and we accumulate all these experiences, and we hold on to them. And so what you're saying, the negativity bias, it's just, I don't know if that even explains it. It's just our ego is saying, yeah, no, I, there were 15 people there and 14 of them thought my dress was awesome. But I know that one person looked at me strange and I bet I know that she didn't like that dress at all. And that's the only thing you're thinking about is that it's just insecurity, fear. And the nice thing for me is that I feel like what this work has taught me is that The road is so simple. There's not a million different things you have to do. You just have to work every day, little by little, on quieting down. Just little by little, little by little. And what that does is it just simplifies things. You're not constantly going, God, what should I be doing to Mm -hmm. help with my sadness right now and my this? And I'm so worried about my kid doing this and that. And oh my God, my husband. Oh, geez. If he says that one more time, I'm going to kill him. And I think it opens up space when you're quiet and you're mindful, opens up space for the good things to come in. Absolutely. And again, it's not just being good at basketball or golf or your job. I really do believe you're a better human when that space opens up, as you said, I just wrote something that's going to come out in a couple days about the biggest gift that we can give anyone is our presence. It's being there and not being all over the place. Do you have kids? Trisha has four. Yeah, Trisha. Oh, you have four. 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 I -hmm. love it. And Dora, you have four, (laughs) right? Four. Parents, especially mothers who are so much more dialed in with their kids. You know what I'm talking about as far as being present. And it's hard. I have three. Doro, can you believe I have a seven-year-old right now? Uh, It's hilarious. They're so adorable, too. Oh, yeah. They're great. They're awesome. I love them. But that's what they really want from us. They want us to be there and not like, I'm sorry, what did you say? What? I'm trying to, you know, watch my movie or whatever. And it's hard, but again, it's a great lesson, I think, is to just remember that that is the best thing we can give somebody is just our attention. And here's a cool thing, because I know you guys are, this is in the article, but it is really coolly expressed in this word that I'm sure both of you know, namaste, right? From yoga and all that stuff. You know, a lot of people say that as it's sort of a hello or it's sort of a greeting of some sort. But it's true, deeper meaning. What you are saying, it's a Sanskrit thing. You are saying, the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. And so what that is, is you're saying the presence in me recognizes the presence in you. When you are being present with somebody, that's what you're doing. And that's why people feel good. They may not even know how to express it, but when someone is really there, they feel good because you're communicating at that deeper level when someone is present. And you're present. 
So David, if people want to get your newsletter or if people want to read your wonderful essays about mindfulness and meditation, how do they do that? Go to medium.com and look me up or go to my website, davidgerkin.net, G-E-R-K-E-N. David, thank you for coming on Health Gig. It's wonderful to see you again. And Trish and I are big fans of what you're doing and your beautiful writing. So well, thank, thank you. you. And, you know, keep it up. And I'm happy that you guys have chosen such a cool area with just health. I mean, my God, it's hugely important. And I hope you guys keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well.